Ladies and gentlemen, oh, everybody's gone silent. Okay, so let, let's get going. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the symposium. I'm Daniel Hastings, Dean for Undergraduate Education, and it's my honor to have you at this symposium, which we're entitling uh, Innovations in Undergraduate Education at MIT, Past, Present, and Future in Tradition of Margaret McVicker and Robert Silby. So this, this symposium honors two of our faculty who have contributed so much over the years to the development of undergraduate education at MIT. Margaret McVicker, of course, is remembered as the first dean for undergraduate education, my predecessor several times removed. I'm honored to follow in her footprints. She's remembered for having created EUROP, uh, Undergraduate Research Opportunities Program, which is now one of the signature programs for undergraduate life here at MIT and is widely copied in the rest of the country. This uh, literally changed the nature of undergraduate education at MIT and of course, the McVicker Fellows, of which we're gonna celebrate four new fellows shortly, the McVicker Fellows Program is also named after her. The symposium also recognizes the major contributions of Bob Silby. His contributions to life and learning at MIT have been many and significant. He was one of the faculty who created Concourse, one of the freshman alternative programs. Later, he served as the co-chair of the Task Force on Student uh, Life and Learning and chair of the Task Force on the Undergraduate Educational Commons. Uh, in these very considerable investments of his time, the latter while he was Dean of Science, he put his stamp on undergraduate education here at MIT. His work I think it's, everybody can say he has made for a much more integrated and cohesive undergraduate experience uh, here at MIT. I've had the privilege of actually implementing some of the recommendations from his uh, undergraduate commons report. Uh, and I, I can say, given all the things that he's done, he's, he's regarded as a giant in the field of undergraduate education here. Like the four fellows we're going to announce today, he was also recon recognized for the quality of his teaching uh, as a McVicker Fellow. Finally, before I introduce the fellows, let me say I think these are, are exciting times for undergraduate education here at MIT. Uh, it seems these things come and go in waves, but in, in my 26 years here, uh, it seems like a high point again. Uh, we're having um, lots of discussions uh, driven by the announcements around MITx. Uh, I can also recall a wave of excitement around the uh, task force on the, on the undergraduate educational commons, which of course said Bob chaired, and the announcement of the Darboloff funds for innovations in undergraduate education uh, quite a few years ago. Uh, basically what these things show is that MIT as an institution cares deeply about undergraduate education and still is a first rank R1 institution. These things do not have to be at odds with each other, but indeed can actually work together. And certainly for the as seen in the example of Margaret McVicker and Bob, they were not at odds with each other. So with those preliminary comments, let me turn to the announcement of the next class of McVicker Fellows. So I'm pleased to announce that the provost uh, has chosen Professors uh, Broadhead, Cabling, Kaiser, and Rose as the next McVicker Fellows. Now, what I'm now going to do is ask them to come up one at a time uh, while I read some fine comments about them. <laughs> so let's start with Professor Broadhead. <laughs> now, you're, on, you're on camera. So you're here, uh, stand right. <laughs> so that's, this is smile, you're on candid camera kind of thing. Right? <laughs> So Professor Broadhead is the class of 1954 Career Development Associate Professor of History and obviously in the history faculty. I'm gonna read for each of them comments from colleagues and comments from students and, and they haven't heard any of these. These are taken from the case, cases that were put together for them which were done, I presume, without their knowledge, right? <laughs> yes. So comments from colleagues about Professor Broadhead. He regards teaching as an essential vocation rather than a mere job. Will is the real deal. You won't find a better, more dedicated, more collegial teacher at the Institute. Another uh, comment, particularly impressive was, was his 
an erring sense of when to explain and when to listen. This quality is an essential complement, component of great teaching. Some comments from students. Professor Broadhead was an incredible and thoughtful professor. He taught with contagious enthusiasm. He took the time to ensure his students have the best opportunities to further their learning and helped provide a way, an interactive international way for professors to see the real life application of their studies. What more could you ask for them from a professor? So congratulations. <laughs> Professor Cabling. <clears throat> professor Cabling is a Panasonic is the Panasonic Professor of Computer Science and Engineering, obviously electrical engineering and computer science. Some comments from colleagues. Leslie is passionate about mentoring undergraduates. Undergraduates felt the need to get more advising on applying for graduate school. Leslie immediately volunteered to run an undergraduate seminar series entitled Getting a PhD, Why, How, and Where. She already has meetings this semester about the application process, funding, what it's like to do a PhD, and why would students want to consider a PhD. Some student comments. Professor Cabling was so unlike any of my previous uh, <laughs> lab professors. <laughs> Uh, that's, that's an interesting uh, way to... <clears throat> she was fun. <laughs> she was excitable and engaging. She made an effort to learn all of our names and gave us individual attention in lab. No small task in such a large class. I was so impressed at the extent to which she thought about the best way to teach every single topic incorporating real life robots, simulation circuits, and more into these really fun 601 modules that so engaged all of us. Another comment, I've, I have not met a professor more approachable than Professor Cabling. None of my friends or lab mates were ever afraid to speak with her about anything, from asking for help on the current assignment to asking for Europe or career advice. I've never seen her turn away anyone's request for any form of assistance. Congratulations. <laughs> Professor Kaiser. <laughs> professor Kaiser is a Germanhausen, is that you say? Germanhausen, professor of the history of science and, and department head science, technology, and society, and also a senior lecturer in physics. <coughs> Comments from colleagues. The class I visited is the rise of modern science, STS 003. The lecture itself was brilliantly conceived and delivered in a lively, interactive way, with Kaiser pausing to entertain questions from students in the midst of his remarks. His style of presentation was sophisticated, clear, perceptive, and accompanied by humorous quips that generated a lot of chuckles and laughter. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly, Kaiser is a gifted lecturer. Student comments. The best commendation I can give about Professor Kaiser's teaching ability is that I've enjoyed his classes so much that I've continued to take classes offered by him despite the fact they're not required for my major. <laughs> the primary reasons I enjoy his classes are the following. One, interesting and pertinent primary sources. Two, good recommendations for additional readings. And three, clear organization of themes that transcend specific time periods. I now have a firm grounding in the history of science outside of my expertise and an extensive list of books I look forward to reading. Another comment, he organizes his lectures meticulously with an eye towards providing not just rich historical detail, complete with equations, hand-drawn diagrams of the blackboard, but just as importantly, the relevant context and wider historical significance as well. He answers questions with patience and modesty and engages students conversationally in class. Congratulations. Professor Rose. <laughs> professor Rose is the Charles P. Kindleberg Professor of Applied Economics in the Economics Department. 
So comments from colleagues. Nancy has taught 1420, the undergraduate industrial organization course over many years. She has completely reorganized the subject matter to make it more contemporary, introduced a computer-based oligopoly game as a platform and teaching method to help the students understand imperfect competition. Nancy has put enormous time and effort into making this course an exciting learning experience. Another comment, Nancy has been one of the few economics faculty members being willing to teach a freshman seminar. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> she decided to organize a seminar on the general topic, the mutual fund industry. This gave her an opportunity to introduce a group of freshmen who had not yet taken a real economics course about a variety of topics in industrial organization, marketing, regulation, and finance. And a student comment. Besides playing with the rigorous models presented in her well-written lecture notes, we spent almost a comparable amount of time reading and discussing the real-world cases that Professor Rose carefully selected. We were motivated by the extensive class discussions that Professor Rose moderated almost every week. The course hosted the most active class participation I've ever seen in an undergraduate economics class. So congratulations, Professor Rose. So I, um, I'm, I'm about to turn it over to my colleague, Professor Henderson, to actually run the rest of the symposium. But let me say, uh, we, this year we had a record number of nominations for the McVicar uh, Fellows. And it truly is the case that these four rose to the top. So once again, congratulations to all of you. So with that, let me turn it over to Professor Henderson, also McVicar, who's going to actually run the rest of the show. Thanks. Thanks, Dan. Um, I was going to force all of my colleagues up on behind this table into the light, but now that I'm realizing they will roast if, if I make them do that prematurely, um, I think we'll have a little change of format. And you can stay out there, folks, uh, until we get to you, at which point, yes, John, he's happy now, um, then we will, uh, over time, accrue into the community that uh, this day represents. Uh, this, as McVicker Day, I think it's three different things we're, we're here celebrating. We're celebrating individual achievement of these wonderful uh, professors who you've just heard about. Uh, we are also celebrating the community of McVickers, the people who uh, share the, the belief that MIT is not only the, the best science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and many other uh, areas, university in the world, uh, but it is also a place that truly values at every level teaching and mentoring. Uh, and especially at the undergraduate level today, we, we honor our colleagues as a community. And then thirdly today, we're honoring, well, we're honoring learning in the persons of Margaret McVicker, after whom this day is uh, named. And today we add with her name uh, the next great voice uh, for life and learning at MIT, at least my experience of the, the next huge footsteps to fill are those of Bob Silby. Uh, for many of us who knew Bob, the loss is still raw. And forgive us if we get a little choked up at some times, but this is a day of celebration. This isn't a day of mourning. It's a day to say thank you uh, for all he did, as well as what Margaret McVicker did, in creating the conditions for us to come together as this community. Um, one of the, I, I think many people know that Margaret, in addition to being the first dean of undergraduate education, was also the founder of the Europe program. And so in a sense, what we honor is not just individual accomplishments that pass away, but we honor people who took the time to serve and change the structures of education at MIT as well well past their being here. And in the same spirit, Bob also um, did so many different kinds of uh, structural con uh, service to MIT that I had a very hard time limiting the number of people. As you can see, it's a pretty long table. We couldn't fit many more in, but there are people in this audience who also know of his contributions and probably know some that I was not able to include. Um, 
things like we don't overtly have biology up here, and yet Bob was among those who argued for the new GIR in biology. Um, we don't have anyone up here from the registrar's office, but Bob helped change the calendar in a way that was designed, colleagues, listen, it was designed to add a week to the uh, semester so that we could have time not for more content, but for reflection. <laughs> and that's a reminder that structural changes don't always work out the way you wish. <laughs> And why I think one of the things I love about working with Bob is he had a healthy sense of reality when it came to structural change. Uh, we worked together on a task force that possibly some would say was not a complete success. Um, we had 33 recommendations on the task force on, undergraduate, on the undergraduate educational commons. Um, more of them have been enacted than you may realize, because only a few got the attention of the community, and those were, of course, the most controversial ones. Uh, but in the, in the process of that, I learned a lot about how you uh, conduct yourself to create community, how you conduct a committee in a way that extends your excellence as a teacher. Because I, there are many reasons I should not be the one standing up here, by the way. I, I could list many reasons. I, I only knew Bob for about the last 10 years of a distinguished 45 years of, of achievement here. There are people out, out in the audience who worked with him for those 45 years, who loved him for longer. Um, I am here from literature. Uh, honoring a great dean of science, <laughs> a great chemist. Um, that is in part because that's who Bob was. He was a man who saw breadth in education, especially undergraduate education, as crucial. And he welcomed me into that second task force uh, as the new kid on the block and listened to me as well as he listened to everyone else, tried to bring us together. And I can honestly say many of the people in this room who are my friends are friends through the experience of being on a task force, a committee. Uh, not many people can make a committee feel like a learning community, but Bob did that. So there is a process that is part of Bob's contribution to education here, as well as the structures, the outcomes. Uh, so whenever I get a little down, I think of, of both Bob and I think he would have liked Sam Beckett. He loved quoting people. And so one quote I love from Samuel Beckett is, fail, try again, fail again, fail better. <laughs> and, and so what we're going to try to do is keep trying again and we're succeeding, but we're also going to fail better by learning from each other, from what those who have followed and are building on what Margaret and, and Bob have done. Uh, as I chose, with the collective help of my friends, I, I looked to people I know are brilliant teachers. I wanted to emphasize collaboration, team teaching, working across boundaries, because these are all things Bob valued so much. And since he began in the world of chemistry, and he stayed in the world of chemistry, even as he did all these other achievements, I, I thought, we should start by hearing about a class Bob himself, team taught. Uh, it's, it's in the spirit of his being a co-creator of Concourse, where he also worked across boundaries. Uh, but today we're hearing from Linda Griffith and Munji Bawendi uh, about their team teaching of thermodynamics. Diana had actually, when she first asked me to do this, to speak a little bit more broadly about Bob, but emphasize this. So I'm going to say a few more things. Um, but first, congratulations and a hearty thank you to our colleagues who are the Newman Vicker Fellows, because it's really, it's really this, t this community of valuing undergraduate education. And in fact, there are lots of, I'll repeat something Dean Hastings says, there are lots of places in the world that have fabulous research, including and especially MIT. But there are no other places in the world that I can think of that values bringing research into the classroom, and particularly undergraduate education, more than MIT. The best research stars teach here. Eric Lander teaches freshman chemistry. And because of that, as I was thinking I was uh, over today, I reflected that maybe that's why so many disciplines get created here at MIT. Chemical engineering started here at MIT. Um, 
biological engineering started as a discipline here at MIT. And in fact, physical chemistry, which is what Bob taught in the early 1900s, the first place it was really taught in the United States was here at MIT, which had the premier chemistry department in the country and continues uh, to, to in that tradition. So, Arguably, this vision of bringing your research into a, a unified core curriculum is the essence of MIT and what sets it apart. And nobody exemplified that better than Bob. So I want to make three brief points about Bob, including about our teaching. The first um, is, uh, is his um, incredible uh, 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 his, his incredible that he valued undergraduate teaching and set by example that no one in MIT is above teaching, that this is what people want to do. So we don't have two classes of people, those who teach and, and those who are research stars. Everybody is involved. And so when we started developing the undergrad, the way I came to teach with Bob and this class got developed, when we started developing the undergraduate curriculum in biological engineering, it was clear that 560, while an excellent course, didn't meet the content that we needed. There was about a third of the course was relevant, but we really had structured it differently. So we started to teach in biological engineering our own physical chemistry course, thermodynamics course, which created some tensions because there was some overlap in content and it was also confusing to students. So we'd had some discussion with the chemistry department about maybe teaching together, but we couldn't agree on a syllabus, not even for the first half of the term. And it came down to some ideological differences about quantum mechanics and statistical mechanics and blah, blah, blah. And I ran into Bob, at, and there was an impasse, and it was really sad because it was not good for students. And I ran into Bob at a party, uh, some, some MIT function, and started talking to him about this. And he says, you know what? I'll teach your course with you. He was dean of science. He says, I'll teach your course with you next term. It was spring term. He hadn't been teaching in chemistry because dean is a busy job. He loved teaching. He said, I'm thinking about writing the next edition of my book. So this would be really fun. And we can figure out how to do this. Because you know what? 25 years ago, when I taught this with John Deutsch, that's actually how we used to organize the first half of the term. So his incredible just being able to solve every problem in this remarkable way was how we started teaching together. So the second uh, part of it, so he taught about a third of the class, and we figured out how to do the syllabus together. And that has endured um, to now, as, as Munji and I will discuss again in a moment. Um, the second point I want to make is his generosity of spirit. Because in setting this up, I had some ideas of how it had to be a biological engineering course. He was totally open to that, including he wrote a textbook. I wanted to use a different textbook for certain reasons that were maybe justified or not. And he was open to that and actually used part, some material from that other textbook. He wanted to teach the Haber process, ammonia, two billion a year product. I set, countered with GCSF, six billion a year product. So he let us use GCSF for a particular <laughs> example. Uh, but that was Bob, and, and I was a newbie to Thermo, and he was so generous in being uh, respectful of my ideas when he was really the brilliant teacher and really knew how to get the material across. Um, and he actually even came in on Sundays to do tutorials for students while he was dean and teaching this class. Okay, so the um, third point I want to make is his incredible collegiality in creating an environment that everyone feels uh, special. And, and I think this is especially important because uh, there's a lot of talk about how women may feel marginalized. But Bob, with, when you got within 10 minutes of knowing him, you knew about his wife, Susan. And you probably also knew that she was the most fascinating person in the world, <laughs> at least to him. And that, not only that, the second two most fascinating people were his two daughters and then his grandchildren. And there's something about having this amazing, brilliant man, kind man, think that a woman is the most fascinating person in the world. Because you know he can think women are smart and interesting and everything else. And there, he didn't have to do anything, just that made him a fabulous colleague. And so the things that he did have endured as um, the, the he, it was good for students to have these two subjects taught together. He set up the culture. Munji Bawindi and I teach together in this course. And in fact, we would, um, I think, agree that Bob never liked to miss a teaching opportunity. So we, together, uh, want to make sure you get, uh, you don't get out of here without a quiz. Okay, so one of Bob's favorite lecture, I claim it's Bob's favorite lecture, but Lindsay said no, Bob has lots of favorite <laughs> lectures. <laughs> Most of the lectures. <laughs> so uh, who thinks that, you know, when you have a chemical reaction, some reactions are spontaneous. 
Who thinks that the heat uh, energy change can tell you the spontaneity? So if it releases heat, it's spontaneous. Absorbs heat, not spontaneous. So who thinks that can tell you the course if it's spontaneous or not? We can vote. <laughs> okay. Who says yes? Who says no? Your chemistry faculty member, please vote no. <laughs> All right. <laughs> We're recording this on video. So. Turn them on and pass them around to your neighbor. When you get them on and you have the reaction go, pass them to your neighbor. Get this one to him. Okay, hopefully some of these are hot and some of these are cold. That's why some of them are called hot packs and some are called cold packs. They should be instant. Are some of them hot and cold? Okay, so you can't. You need a concept called? Free energy. <laughs> free energy. Yeah. Free energy. So free energy is what unites, tells you delta G is equal to delta H, the energy minus T delta S. That's what will tell you the spontaneity at constant temperature and pressure. And the way that Bob introduced this is exactly what we did here today. And students remembered it. I have students now who were my advisees a year ago who, when I said I was going to talk about this, they go, oh, yeah, remember when he did this? And to this day, these are people out, you know, 10 years from MIT now who remember this. And we still do it. I still do it. Well, um, so when I was thinking of um, coming uh, to this symposium, and I wasn't quite sure what I was going to say or, or even what I was going to wear, and at, at, the, at the last minute I was trying to figure out, am I going to wear a tie? <laughs> <laughs> and I remember Bob, you know, he wore ties very well, but he didn't particularly like to wear ties. So I decided not, not to wear a tie today in, in his honor. Um, so as um, Linda mentioned, um, the, the reason why we were asked to, to talk here was really through this course 560, which Bob uh, joined forces with Linda to bring sort of B into the fold of chemistry. So this is my, my own perspective now, on <laughs> parochial perspective from a chemist perspective on, 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 on this process here. So Bob and I had, have, had, had taught 560 for many, many years. In, in fact, I remember the first time that I that I taught with Bob, and I was ex extremely intimidated because he had this 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 aura, and he had this this following, and he he was known to be this brilliant teach teacher, and and I was going to ha have to teach the second half, and he was going to teach the first half, <laughs> and that was already uh, uh, the stuff of nightmares. Uh, <clears throat> but I, I went into the to, to the first lecture, and I was really awed by the way that he introduced uh, the material and the command that he had of the class and the stories. He immediately started by by telling stories. Um, and uh, that was one of the things that he was well known for, is his incorporation of anecdotes and of the historical uh, characters that come into the, the science that, that, that we all learn about, Pauli or, or Schrodinger or Mr. Gibbs, uh, all these people. He brought them to life as he was, as he was, uh, as he was teaching. Um, and so I, I, um, I took copious notes, and I, I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I admit that I freely plagiarize, you know, from, from those notes that I took, which, um, and I, then I asked him for his notes for the class, um, and um, it was a good thing that I took copious notes because they were not very, uh, not very complete, and, and Sylvia Sayer has a story of asking him for his notes for teaching the harmonic oscillator, and Bob giving her a piece of paper with the, with the words, the harmonic oscillator, <laughs> on top. <laughs> um, his notes to me were a little bit more complete than that, but that just shows he, had, he, he just knew the material inside out and he just didn't need to prepare. He could just get, stand in front of the audience and just give this amazing presentation, pedagogical, full of enthusiasm, and, 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 and the students got it. So in any case, when um, I heard um, when th that you know, he was joining forces with Linda, that he was teaching with Linda, um, and uh, you know, he thought that I think he had a. I think he had a master plan. I, I don't think this was completely um, 
Well, he, he always had a master plan. So, I mean, uh, Bob felt very strongly that, you know, undergraduates should get a very strong foundation in what they learned from MIT. So the, the importance of quantum mechanics in uh, freshman chemistry was really crucial to him. Uh, the importance of teaching the basics of thermodynamics in a very fundamental way so that even engineering students in biology would understand where free energy comes from, that was really important to him. And so, um, and then making sure that the chemistry department uh, had its fingerprints still for these topics. Um, and so when he start, start, started teaching with Linda, I'm, I'm sure he already thought of the idea that, you know, we should get, really create this course and merge it together. And so after these pilot uh, studies with Linda teaching where, uh, you know, he brought in the 560 curriculum and, and massaged it with, along with Linda to make it fit into what, 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 what uh, the, the, the BE folks wanted to see out of it, you know, then we started having a bunch of meetings to bring in the broader chemistry uh, faculty that was teaching 560 and to hammer out more details of how to get basically the two, two departments together and, and to teach you know, what basically is hundreds of students a year um, in, in this topic. Um, and so you know, he managed to cajole some of us, well, I was open to it, but some of people who are not so open to the idea that you, know, you could share disciplines and, and then you could rearrange the uh, the, the curriculum, as long as you kept the foundation there very strongly, you could take examples. And, you know, I'm glad that, that Linda remembers the Haber process because actually we, we still teach the Haber process. <laughs> so, the, so, so Bob had this uncanny ability to, you know, make people feel good. And 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 to uh, and he 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 was a he was very collegial. He was a collaborator, and he was extremely uh, willing to listen, but also still get his way. So the Hubber process is still is still there. Um, <laughs> we'll talk later. Um, uh, anyway, so um, I also um, took part in in editing or helping to write this book, which was. Uh, um, that, that Bob, uh, that Linda talked about. And um, I have to say that um, the way that, that he wrote the book was sort of the way that he wrote, you know, the harmonic oscillator is that it, it poured out of him uh, in a way that was seemed completely uh, um, uh, so easy. Uh, and, and I remember I had a little passage to write and it took me all night and I, you know, one of these all-nighters that you do when you're in graduate school. And then I came out with a few pages of text the, the next day and handed them to Bob and, you know, half an hour later, it was completely changed. It, all the, it was all corrected, and it was so much better than, than I had, uh, you know, thought of, uh, of writing it at the time. So he had this uh, this gift for pedagogy. He had a gift for getting people together. Uh, he loved the undergraduates, and uh, and as he said himself, he was he was wired for sound. So he could stand in front without a microphone and and get the whole class to uh, to to be uh, to be with him. And I think I'm going to stop here at this point. One thing in transition. The other thing is that teaching collaborations lead to research collaborations because Munji and I now have a research project together that has spawned a company, going into clinical trials. So this is another important thing at MIT. A lot of, we do really cool research across boundaries because we all care about teaching and run into each other on these infernal committees. <laughs> No, it's true. No, the undergraduate <laughs> teaching brings us together. No, no, they're great committees. Actually. <laughs> Thank you. See, I think we're already modeling what I, I wanted to get across about team teaching, um, and, but also about collaboration, which is, is blurring these boundaries between whether we're talking about research, teaching, community building. It's all part of the same. One of the things I did when I was became uh, Dean for Curriculum and Faculty Support is uh, hold some mixers along with Bob co-sponsoring co and just getting people together, you don't know what's going to come out of that. Uh, the serendipitous uh, meetings, one of my colleagues in literature, Mary Fuller, met someone over in Eeps and all of a sudden they're teaching a freshman seminar together on Northern Studies. Who could predict that? I certainly couldn't have organized the meeting that would have had made that happen. It was letting our amazing faculty get together and feel like they were um, welcome to experiment in these various ways. 
Speaking of experimentation and change, um, we're shifting for a moment. We've been talking in a lot of ways about the past, that is building on Bob Silby specifically, what he taught. And we'll be moving now to some of the wider consequences of the task force number one that he uh, co-chaired with Don Hansman. Um, and then we'll be moving towards the future. There is a method in my madness here. Uh, looking at a class which Bob would know nothing about, but I think, again, um, fi uh, did, would fit the, the mood of what we're talking about really quite elegantly, and speaks to a wider audience of those of you for whom uh, there is no personal connection here. I think we're trying to establish the principles of a community that keeps on going. Uh, so with that in mind, uh, John Essigman, also from chemistry, but here today to speak in that wider communal sense about some of what came out of and endures from the first task force on life and learning. Thanks. Thank you, Diana. I'm also half in BE, so I'm, we've heard from a BE, a chemist, and now half and half, and uh, who understands what the, the Haber process is. And I wish Linda and Munji all the best in their new company to get, make more than $2 billion a year on the Haber process, since we've learned that's not enough. <laughs> so um, as, as uh, most of you know, uh, Bob was the consummate theorist. And so he was a person out of the collection of the community of scholars who was able to visualize worlds that some of the rest of us can't see, and then work in a partnership with engineers and chemists in order to, in, 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 our, in our chemistry domain, in order to find out what those worlds are and, and perhaps build them and understand them. Uh, and the task force on student life and learning was a process that where I think that Bob and John Hansman created a world uh, in, in, in a lot of students. And I had the privilege, I've had the privilege of the last 10 years of actually living in a Bob Silby experiment. So I'm gonna tell you what that's like. <laughs> So uh, the task force um, was, a, was really a punctuation mark in MIT's history. Uh, periodically, we have considered who we are and where we're going. Uh, John Hansman and Bob were the, the co-chairs of the task force. And uh, one of the things that was, a, you know, I, it occurred to me when Linda was speaking is that in, in these punctuation marks that um, uh, Lewis was indeed, I believe, the chemical engineer who created, invented chemical engineering here at MIT. And uh, so uh, William Barton Rogers set out the, the original foundation of this institution, defining us as a technical university. In the Lewis report, just after World War II, we started considering, well, we needed to train more broad students, create, for example, the GIRs, include humanities and social sciences as the critical to the training of a person who would be a 20th century scientist. And then in thinking about the 21st century scientist, we included some other things. And so principles 9, 10, and 11 were what they, 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 they crystallized out in Task Force One, the Task Force on Student Life and Learning embracing the importance of diversity in everything that we do, channeling, harnessing the enormous intensity, curiosity, and excitement of young students in anything that happens here productively for society's benefit, and then taking three things that we did very well, the triad, academics, research, and community. They've always been there, they've been connected together, but perhaps to use a chemistry term, connect them more covalently on the path ahead. So um, the, uh, I, I mined through the task force on student life and learning, and um, there, are, there are about 11 points here. And I'm just gonna kind of go through them, but these are the things that they set out as things that we needed to do as a community. And the first one I've drawn on the bottom with little figures, you know, we all come to MIT and, uh, you know, as freshmen, as graduate students, as faculty members, and we're not really yet a member of a community. But then over time, and for you know, a, a student who comes here for four years, we hope it's gonna take less than four years, you develop collegiality, if not outright friendship. A person like a chemist, would, like Bob, would think, well, what is it we can do to accelerate that process? Okay, but we'll come to that in just a minute. 
the task force identified this, this getting faculty, students, students, student interactions as being absolutely key. And how can we change the life learning interface in order to promote that? We didn't have the best community spaces. We didn't have adequate performance spaces. If you wanted to put on an event, it might take two to three years to reserve Kresge. Uh, there's a lot of informal teaching and learning that goes on on campus, but we didn't really have a record of it and how it's done well and be able to pass that along to the next generation of people in our community. It's a pretty cultural place, but it perhaps wasn't cultured enough and we weren't sharing our, our experiences. We needed, of course, to take our, our undergrads and graduate students and build in leadership, but also try to teach them how to be good team members or good followers, because that's important as well. And the two most contentious things at the bottom, um, um, I'll just say a dining plan, but that really means that over food, that's a great way for people to get together and to talk about things, which is really important. And at the time, um, the report was, came right out in black and white and said all freshmen should live on campus. And again, this was something that was, wasn't easy for the community to swallow. Bob, um, I wish I could do his voice. I've always wanted to have his voice, but you know, um, with his resonant voice, you know, if you went to him and said, how are we gonna solve this community thing? You know, you could just see him say, John, the hands would go out and with the pointing and he would say, um, what we need is an equation this long, okay, that will be a formula and we, then we basically get some experimentalists and, and again, I live in a dorm, I'm a house master, I'm an experimentalist in this way, get a good catalyst and a bunch of money and then move ahead. And now that Linda has taught you about thermodynamics, <laughs> in, uh, in, in, in Bob's way of thinking, you know, these are, these are all, you know, the, all problems can be solved this way. So you have a problem, a starting point over here, and you want to get to this end point. So you're here and you want to get to here. And you all now know that those reactions that were sent out, that they were all spontaneous, you know, you all know that. And so this is really the, you know, basically, this is what you gain in doing going from here to here. But things don't just happen real quickly in the real world and that there are these things we'll call energy barriers that prevent things from happening quickly. This might be the arrangement of people at a party meeting like Linda met Bob Silby at a party or it might be molecules arranging. I need a catalyst. Yeah, so that's what Bob would say is you need a catalyst to make these things happen <laughs> which facilitates the Equilibrium of your product, we're a team here, yeah, uh, uh, products and, and reactants. Well, what could be these, and this, you know, with a catalyst, you could do this maybe in two weeks rather than four years. Okay. And that'd be good. And the thing that's good about catalysts is they increase rate and they're typically quantifiable. So what would be an example of like how to make this thing happen real well? And I think Europe, since we're celebrating Margaret today, in part, is a phenomenal example that came before the task force on student life and learning. But it was probably at the time, I think, the best example of making this reaction go very well. What else could we do? Well, Europe's great, but it works on this side of Mass Ave. And you know that broken line down the middle? That's a semi-permeable membrane. <laughs> And the students go back and forth, so they enjoy Europe and their other interactions with each other and the faculty over here, but look at this. It just doesn't work. Okay? It didn't work at the time. And the task force is really, well, how are we going to be able to utilize, in a learning sense, this other part of the community, this other half? So with the investment on the part of an administration that really listened, they started doing things. And so the thing I'm going to talk about is, you know, where the places that, where the, the communities that we created and how we use catalytic opportunities in order to enhance student life. So you take this, the Simmons Hall, it's an incubator. You put in a bunch of undergraduates, graduate students, house masters with a lot of experience. Put in people who are sabbatical leave visitors from other places. We bring in fresh ideas. And you also, you've got to have a ball pit. That's really important. <laughs> the latest example is Massey Hall. Again, I think they did it right. You mix together the same ingredients. They don't have a ball pit. But they have a wonderful dining hall. And dining is something that's actually bringing faculty across that semi-permeable membrane because the food's good. It's a good community. And they're sitting down and they're talking with students. I think that's terrific. So we're investing in our infrastructure now to try to create environments that are 
bringing in members of the faculty and others from MIT, but also people from the local community. So here's an event, Halloween, trick or treat, 300 kids come and they get their, you know, they're, they're scared to death by, you know, various things that pop out of little models of Simmons Hall. You um, create spaces Remember I said that there aren't, weren't a lot of places for students to get together that were comfortable, and you make them available to M MIT's big service fraternity that wants to get together people in a comfortable place and recruit their new members. You create places to perform. Remember the Kresge problem? Um, so you know, several of the new residence halls have performance space. So these are two graduate students who are part of Quicksilver Dance Company who are practicing right now for a performance that's going to be on in, in April. Uh, this is John White. Some of you may know him practicing for, you know, actually doing an improvisational comedy routine. Here are some students that just sort of stood up one night at dinner and started singing a cappella. Places to watch and learn. So uh, when you've got spaces for cool things to happen, then people start inviting really important people. This is a big highlight in my life, getting to meet the Dalai Lama. The Dalai Lama came. He, sat down with 150 students, and I tell you, I mean, none of these kids are gonna be the same again. And not only is he a great guy, but just sort of like, you know, the way he can relate to people is just, just you know, absolutely off scale. Places to work. Um, we've had a lot of tragedies at MIT this year, and the, the, the issues of student isolation are on everyone's mind. The new spaces that have been created really you know, these are students working on a problem set. These are students working in an Athena cluster. These are students who have captured an MIT professor to get some help on homework, okay? This is good. And they really want to make new friends. Um, the original template of the Task Force on Student Life and Learning really laid out you know, what these spaces should be like. And one of the things in the, from the committees that came out f subsequent to the task force is that we should really have places to meditate. And it turns out these kids don't need or want to meditate. They want to play. And so they, you know, given some power tools, they just took and destroyed the meditation room, bought 5,000 colored balls, and made a ball pit. And <laughs> if any of you want to have your yeah, this looks like a Facebook crowd. I want to have your Facebook pictures uh, taken. This is the most popular place on campus to have your Facebook um, you know, picture taken. And then the dining plan. As I mentioned, uh, when I mentioned Massey, we now have a, a responsible dining plan. The students fought against it so hard. But now I think if you tried to take it away from them, there would be armed rebellion. Because you serve wine at the dinner now. <laughs> That's actually sparkling uh, cider. Yeah. We've, <laughs> Yeah, I've got, um, <laughs> gosh, she's got good eyes. Okay. <laughs> the, um, uh, and the students, what, now that they've got a dining plan, now they're, like, they are disassembling the, the, the dining halls, and they want to make it th some, like something that they love, which is Hogwarts. And so you know, they'll, take their, they'll take their meditation room, they'll convert it into a ball pit, their dining hall, convert it into Hogwarts. So the, the, the invention is there that you always expect. In most of the new structures, we now have sabbatical leave visitors who live, who live there, bringing you know, an enormously valuable outside perspective. This fellow is a, um, a fighter pilot from Vietnam. Uh, this is Kalarati, a, a very well-known architect. This is Tenzin Priyadarshi, who is the fellow who brought the Dalai Lama to, to the building. The, uh, these folks have some really interesting friends. The author, Robert Thurman, came, you know, standing room only. People from all over the community come. And I'll tell you, ordinarily, I mean, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, uh, the students wouldn't have had, I think, these kinds of opportunities. Also, each, each uh, finishing up now, so each residence hall has sort of its signature project. So Senior House has something called Steer Roast. Next House has Next Act. And for the students in this storm, they really, got into having a Buddhist monk living among them, and they have six Buddhist monks come every other year, and their event is this really neat art project, putting together a sand mandala that has a lot of um, you know, interesting storytelling elements to it, since it's a cosmograph. Very, very pretty piece of art. And they're very proud, because the students organize the event, invite the people to come, and I think get all the credit for, for having done it. So to wrap up this task force, brought together 
over on the other side of Mass Ave, communities brought in more older adult um, members of the community to, I think, enrich things. So it's no longer, I think, just a, you know, um, undergraduate territory only. It's all for a good thing. So now we've got a young generation of students who are, real, of course, what they're always good at is solving problems. But I think that they're also, they're the kind of people now, they're very sensitive to the needs of others. They're uh, more um, worldly as a result of, I think, creating this, this, this um, three-part community research and academics uh, triad that was defined in the task force report. Now, if I took a look at that laundry list of things that MIT wanted to do, the punch list, uh, perhaps an engineer would say, pretty much in uh, 12 years, I think you could pretty much check off everything was done. I think it's very much for the better of MIT. So what I do is I give Bob a gold star. Thank you very much. <laughs> Um, the third part of our symposium is uh, a, a, a change of area. We've been hovering in one part of the curriculum when we've gone into the curriculum, and now we're balancing it a bit. This picks up on task force two, as I said earlier. Um, some people might not imagine that that much changed, and, and when I use the word change, I'm sure half of you remember change, change, which was one of Bob's favorite jokes. That is, how many professors does it take to change a light bulb? <laughs> change, <laughs> change, and yet he said that with great affection, and as he said it, we kept changing. Uh, we maybe didn't change always in exactly the ways uh, some of us thought we should change, but we changed. And so out of the task force number two, which was trying to pick up on what the first task force maybe did not entirely achieve, that was curricular change uh, and innovation in the classroom, pedagogical and curricular, um, we, we did a lot. We, we certainly have become more global as a school. We may be creating one version of Hogwarts. I heard one of our uh, students at the OME uh, dinner the other night described going on the Cambridge Ex MIT Exchange uh, program as being living in Hogwarts. Um, and so these opportunities globally, these opportunities in terms of valuing diversity, we have a ways to go, but we're building on them. Uh, and another area in terms of curriculum where we made a huge change uh, was in our HASS requirements in the humanities, arts, and social sciences area, which it now is. That is, we added an arts component to the curriculum as a requirement for every student who graduates from MIT. That says something about the value of creativity, innovation, and performance. Um, now, having said that, we haven't gotten entirely where we want to go yet. There are some. I now know where to t take my students when they want to perform, um, but we're still having some issues, you know, with, a, with the kind of complex some of us would like to see. But we're moving in the right direction, um, and the curriculum is part of that. Another part of the curriculum that it was generally felt, while the Has D system had had a really wonderful reason for being and being created, um, that like many parts of curriculum, it's, it's sometimes you just need to change because it's time for some change. Um, and sometimes you need to change because people have forgotten the spirit with which the innovation was introduced. And in this case, we had moved from a world where we thought we were creating wonderful, exciting introductory classes of a broad nature, totally appropriate for our freshmen, and it had turned into pick one from column two and one from column five and I can't find a three. And nobody knew what that meant. And so now at least we've changed our distribution so that students know they take one humanities, one arts, one social science, and we can put language with that and begin at least to distinguish different disciplinary approaches within the humanities, arts, and social sciences. At the same time, we felt we were losing something of breadth in those Has D classes. So what we did, we, we started thinking about the other phrase that Bob loves, which is that education is not filling a bucket, but it is lighting a fire, uh, variously attributed to Yates and Cicero and a number of other people. Again, we create a community. Uh, we don't worry about exactly who should get the credit. Uh, we do it together. And in the process, we started 
piloting some classes. We first called them big ideas classes. That went over like a lead balloon. Um, then we tried first year focus. People said, oh, but I, I'm not a first year and I want to take them. OK, we're not going to make them just for freshmen. Uh, and now we're calling them something that is no doubt of offending all sorts of people across the country, hex subjects. That is humanities exploration. Uh, it's <laughs> subject, pilot subjects. Um, we like it. It's a little, it, you know, we have a class called the supernatural that is one of the hex subjects. So what more can you ask for it at a, MIT? And we're close to Salem. So with that in mind, with that in mind, in the spirit of piloting and ex exploration, we don't know where it's going to go exactly. We know we're trying some wonderful new approaches, though, in our curriculum. And again, in the spirit of what we've been talking about today, um, I wanted you to hear from one such wonderful class, which has led, and again, this is, I don't want it to be too much just this is all about Bob because it's about all the people who are building in sympathy with that vision. Um, but one I think I think he'd love because he also went around saying, we're so old in our curriculum that we're new again. Well, <laughs> I can think of something, nothing more surprising than that one of our most exciting new collaborations involves some of our newer great teachers including one of today's McVickers, making ancient and medieval studies a hot topic at MIT. So with that, I turn it over to Will and Arthur. <laughs> so let's see if I can get us. There we go. Um, so I'm going to introduce you a little bit to the ancient and medieval studies program, but I wanted to start with something that will be a little bit more uh, familiar to all of you, uh, namely Building 6, um, which has become one of my favorite spots on campus because of uh, the three inscriptions over the door, which I have on good authority a lot of people have completely ignored, even physicists. Um, on the right, no surprise, Newton, physicist. On the left, Van Toff, chemist. In the middle, Virgil, a Roman poet. <laughs> What's he doing there? Um, well, it's a well-chosen passage from Virgil's Georgics, which is a didactic poem on farming. And it says, in Latin, of course, right? So I would have translated it for you. Blessed is he who has succeeded in learning the causes of things and has trampled underfoot all fears and inexorable fates and the howl of devouring death. <laughs> right, this is a almost explicit reference to Lucretius's didactic poem on an atomic version uh, theory of the, of the world um, on the nature of things. And uh, Lucretius's argument was, if you come with me and learn about atoms, you won't have to fear the afterlife and so you can be happy, right? So that, um, that makes good sense. But why in the 1930s, which I think is when Building 6 was constructed, uh, would Virgil have been chosen uh, to go right in the middle, uh, over the door? I don't know the answer to that question. Um, but when I passed through that door, I guess that maybe it was uh, an attempt to exploit the uh, um, prestige of one of the ancient world's finest poets to lend a bit of gravitas and credibility um, to the study of the natural sciences. Uh, or maybe it was a playful poke at the likes of Harvard saying, ha ha, uh, <laughs> you one of your great heroes of the humanistic canon is actually telling us we should all be studying physics and not literature. Um, <laughs> Uh, whatever the reason behind the choice in the 1930s was, it's pretty obvious that um, Virgil would not serve that same purpose now. Um, if you quoted Virgil or anyone else as an explanation for why you chose your major at MIT, you might be considered eccentric uh, at best, uh, completely insane probably. <laughs> Uh, uh, at worst. The standing of classics, that is to say, has just changed so much, both in the academy and in American society um, more broadly, that this kind of decision just, it just wouldn't work um, anymore. And it's really with a full appreciation of that modern reality that we in ancient and medieval studies um, here at MIT have over the last couple of years, this is a really recent uh, development, attempted to craft a program that can provide a meaningful educational experience to the modern uh, MIT student. So the idea is not to impart a comprehensive body of knowledge about antiquity, um, but rather to introduce our students to just a sampling of this uh, very fine material and then to engage them in a range of different ways of thinking critically um, about it, which appeals to the, the quote Diana just offered us a moment ago. So it's an approach that really foregrounds disciplinary differences um, in a context that simultaneously emphasizes similarities and the synergy of those disciplines. 
Of course, none of this would be uh, none of this would work uh, if not for the dedicated uh, faculty that we can rely on. So you start with personnel. It all starts with personnel. You can have a nice, uh, nice system, beautifully designed course, but if you don't have people who want to teach it with passion, um, you're in trouble. All right, so we're not many in number, um, but we are growing, and we know a lot about uh, imperialism, so <laughs> be warned. We have plans to be the most important MS program on campus, so CMS, we have your number. Um, <laughs> um, uh, at any rate, so th there are 11 of us, uh, and um, this is, we, there will be 11 next year, I should say, as literature is about to hire, uh, has hired, and she will start next year, Stephanie Frampton, as a new classicist in that faculty. Uh, four of us in the history faculty, myself uh, and uh, Steve Ostro. Are you here yet, Steve? He said he was going to come straight from recitation. He is. Fantastic. Uh, and Anne McCants and Eric Goldberg uh, in literature, Arthur Barr, from whom you're going to hear in a moment, and as I said, the newly appointed classicist, uh, Stephanie Frampton. Beyond those two departments, so all of our teaching um, supports the Ancient to Medieval Studies program. Beyond our department, those two departments, there are five further affiliated faculty, um, two in philosophy, Ray Langton and Sally Haslinger, uh, one in music, Michael Cuthbert, uh, and two in the School of Architecture, namely Nasser Abbat and John Oxendorf. Right? Um, so we go to 11, right, to quote Spinal Tap. And we like to think that we, um, <laughs> we like to think that we punch above our weight, and that's largely because uh, we're committed to collaboration. Um, both formally, that is to say we co-teach in the classroom, uh, and informally outside the classroom, working together to create a community, which is clearly one of the buzzwords for the day, and that's a community both of faculty uh, and of students interested in ancient and medieval studies, right? The students are one of our greatest resources. We actually use them <laughs> um, as part of the program because they're so, they're so good. Uh, the program has also benefited greatly from a grant in 2008 uh, from the Class of 1960 Endowment Fund for Innovation in Education. Right? These sources of funding are crucial uh, to making things happen on campus. And there were several uh, tangible outcomes of that grant. One was this new course that Arthur's going to speak about in more detail in a moment on empires, our interdisciplinary humanities exploration course. Uh, another was um, uh, jump-starting the teaching of Latin language in the literature section. Uh, and another was a much-needed uh, website for the ancient and medieval studies program itself. Each of those um, uh, outcomes has contributed a new and exciting element to the educational experience uh, in AMS, but what that grant also did, and this is, uh, um, yeah, hi guys. <laughs> what that grant also did was force us to come together, talk to each other, realize what each other did, uh, and figure out how to make that work well um, together as a unit, as a program. So that provided stimulus to create uh, even more community, which I think we all find extremely uh, rewarding. We like each other, and that, that helps. Another relatively uh, recent, sorry, I was going to show you a quick slide of the Empire course, which Arthur could talk about in a moment. Uh, another relatively recent innovation in the Ancient Medieval Studies program uh, is our IAP trip to Italy um, to look at the ancient and medieval remains of Rome uh, and the Bay of Naples area. This is a program we first piloted in 2006, and we've run it six times since then, uh, in the process taking 75 uh, students with us for um, a 10 day exploration of all this wonderful archaeology, uh, the program is led by two, sometimes three professors from the history faculty, and we provide uh, about 30 hours um, of rigorous on-site instruction, uh, and then, of course, about as much time again in informal settings. Right? This is a wonderful way to create community amongst a small group, um, and many of the participants have remained tight um, with us and with each other uh, long after their participation in this particular program. So with these various initiatives of the last couple of years, um, we've succeeded, I think, in making the most of our human and financial uh, resources over here in ancient and medieval studies to provide an educational program that introduces our students to some, not all, some of the greatest hits among the written and archaeological remains of the ancient and medieval world, both here in the classroom at MIT and on site in Italy, um, and informally in, in conversation in both places while at the same time demonstrating to them the diversity of questions that one can ask about this material, uh, the different approaches one can take, the different analytical goals that one can adopt, um, and the different but equally satisfying educational payoffs um, that are to be had. So if we come back to um, Virgil, if we turn back to that passage of Virgil I began with, he provides a nice little example uh, of the multifaceted critical and analytical um, experience that one can have uh, looking at this sort of material. Now on the face of it, Virgil's Georgics is a didactic poem about farming, 
right? <laughs> it tells you about field crops, trees, vines, uh, beekeeping, stock rearing, uh, all kinds of useful things for an Italian farmer. Um, it included a lot of what counted at the time probably as the science of, of farming, and in many passages it reads like a training manual, but that's not at all what Virgil was up to. <laughs> um, he was interested not at all, really, in providing a training manual. Uh, he was mostly interested in teaching a moral, ethical lesson. So if we come back to that passage we looked at a moment ago uh, on building six, the first, the part that's on the building, basically says, uh, blessed is he who studies physics, because you will understand the world and you won't be scared anymore. The very next part, which is not on the building, but happy, too, is he who knows the rural gods, Pan and aged Sylvanus and the sisterhood of the nymphs. Him no honors the people give can move, no purple worn by despots, no strife which leads brother to betray brother. Right? The message is clear. If you learn physics, you'll be happy because you won't be afraid of the supernatural. You will also become greedy, ambitious, and fratricidal. Right? So <laughs> physics leads to civil war. Right? <laughs> I'm watching you, Kaiser. <clears throat> uh, <laughs> all, uh, all hyperbole aside, right? You can see how Virgil here has an awful lot to offer the student of moral uh, philosophy, right? That is to say, he's inviting you to acknowledge that, in fact, there are benefits both to scientific rationalism and to rustic uh, ignorance. Uh, Virgil. Um, obviously also has a lot to offer the student of uh, literature. John Dryden called the Georgics uh, the best poem by the best poet. So, told you so, Arthur. <laughs> um, uh, one can obviously appreciate his use of language. Uh, you can look at the way in which he uh, paints with the ablative, as one of my former colleagues used to describe um, Virgil. You could uh, enjoy the way in which he engages with a longer literary tradition of didactic poetry or a longer literary tradition of um, praising right, this sort of uh, the lost golden age of innocent bliss, which he does throughout the poem. Um, for me, the poem was most interesting uh, for what it tells us about this guy, uh, Augustus. The poem was written, or was finished, we're told, in 29 BC, which was a moment uh, that came after 15 years of basically constant civil war um, at Rome when the young Octavian, who was to become Augustus, had finally defeated um, Mark Antony and Cleopatra and basically taken control of the whole uh, of the Roman Empire at that time. And no one was quite sure what was going to happen next. There must have been a lot of anxiety, optimism, and hope that he might sort everything out provide a nice new golden age, but a little bit of fear too. Uh, and so when you read Virgil in that context, hopefully you can see how there's another layer uh, of interest for those of us who are um, more focused on the, uh, the sort of political context of this important moment of Roman uh, imperial history. Uh, and with that as my segue, I'll turn it over to Arthur, who's gonna tell you a little bit more about the class on empires, um, of which Augustus forms a very important part. <laughs> Thanks, Will. Um, so I'm relatively new to MIT, and I did not have the good fortune to know uh, Bob personally, but I'm delighted to hear that he didn't particularly like ties, um, because I don't either. Um, and so it's lovely to feel that I have that um, in common with him. Um, so as, as Will alluded to, and I'm going to remove for a moment, the distracting image of Augustus. Um, as Will alluded to, uh, one of our main goals in the Ancient and Medieval Studies program is to give students a sharper sense uh, both of the disciplinary differences that exist within uh, Shas and also of, the, of how those disciplines can be usefully set in dialogue with one another. And reinforcing that dual recognition um, of the importance of disciplinary integrity on the one hand, um, and also of interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary conversation on the other, um, is a goal that itself transcends boundaries of departments and schools, uh, since it means that wherever our students end up spending most of their energy here at the Institute, they will do so not just with a stronger sense of what makes Shasta's various areas of inquiry valuably distinct, but also of how respecting such uniqueness, while also pushing at its boundaries, can yield intellectual dividends, whether in the lab, the seminar room, or the lecture hall. 
Asian and medieval studies offers especially fruitful ways of making that case, which is why we're so delighted that our major ongoing team teaching enterprise has been made a uh, Hass exploratory or, as Diana has pointed out, hex subject. Our subject is on the representation and reality of pre-modern empires, and we have three case studies. The transition from Roman Republic to empire uh, under Augustus that Will has alluded to. Um, the the so-called Carolingian Renaissance um, that Char Charlemagne's forging of something that begins to look like a concept of a united Europe um, in the early Middle Ages. And then uh, a unit on Ambition, English imperial ambitions in France during the Hundred Years' War. And in teaching this course, we dive into archaeology, philology, history, manuscript studies, art history, and literary criticism. We try to keep that breadth from overwhelming students, though, by making it clear that all of those disciplines, and I'm picking up here on something Will said, all of those disciplines designate not just certain objects of study, but also certain modes of inquiry. We therefore find ways of emphasizing that one can legitimately ask different questions of the same materials. We read Virgil's Aeneid both as a political and topographical historians, for example, finding traces of Augustus, oh, I'll fine, I'll put him back up. <laughs> finding traces of Augustus and his building projects in the poem. But we also read the Aeneid as literary scholars, uh, thinking about Virgil's tragic Dido alongside Ovid's depiction of the same character. We stress further that these readings need not be in conflict with one another that Virgil's ambivalent attitudes toward female political power, visible in his treatment of Dido and highlighted by comparison with Ovid's rather more sympathetic text, may complement our understanding of, of Virgil's attitude towards Augustus, whose powerful wife Livia was deeply distrusted by many Romans, as those of you who have seen I, Claudius, have good reason to know. <laughs> One of our strongest beliefs about teaching is that it should make its goals and methods as transparent as possible. And part of how we do that is by having all three professors actively participate in all the class meetings, regardless of whose chrono chronological bailiwick we're inhabiting at the moment. Sometimes that participation is structured and planned, but more often it actually is not. I remember especially vividly uh, one example from last uh, fall when our colleague Eric Goldberg challenged me on the way that I was interpreting the word chivalry in a discussion of Foissart's Chronicles of the Hundred Years' War. He was approaching the word as an historian of medieval hunting and military practices in which chivalry's primary meaning is its etymological one of horsemanship. As a literary scholar, I was thinking of the word's associations with the courtly love tradition of Arthurian literature. And in this particular case, it's really both, since Foissart was both a prolific, prolific poet and a historian who was writing for an audience of tough-minded war leaders who nevertheless recognized the potential of soft power grounded in literary allusions. What was exciting about that moment was that it allowed the students to participate in a live, unscripted debate, Eric and I were far from the only ones talking, about how most compellingly and responsibly to approach certain forms of data and evidence. It's a bit of a high wire act, um, since if such a discussion goes south, it can reinforce the presumption uh, among some students that all has subjects, or at least all the humanities, are equivalently and fuzzily subjective. But when it works, as I think it did then and in the class more broadly, the students come away with a new appreciation, um, both for the intellectual rigor and passion with which we and Shas approach our subjects, but also for the potential and the challenges facing the would-be uh, transdisciplinarian, whether in Shas, the sciences, or in engineering, some of which we've heard uh, Linda and Munji talk compellingly about earlier. I'd like to conclude by taking you th through a few images of a medieval manuscript that I use in our empire class by way of illustration. This is, a, this is one page of a copy of Pope John XXII's treatise on the benefits of praying the rosary. And you can see a stylized representation of the beads here in between the two columns of text. 
That string of beads, as you can see, is connected by a thin red line to an image of a bloody hand clasping a crown of thorns. Pedagogically, this image is valuable because it forces us to think across traditional disciplinary boundaries. In order to engage with this page, we must enter the worlds of art history, textual scholarship, and religious studies at the very least. That cross-disciplinary framework is analogous to the way that the boundary between text and image itself becomes blurred on the page. Red ink becomes both a medium of textual dissemination in the two columns of text, and also a reminder of the sacrificial blood shed at the Passion, which is especially visible here in this detail of the hand and crown of thorns. This would remind the medieval reader that Christ's sacrifice is the precondition both for the promise of pardon that the text itself describes and also for the key words of medieval Catholic devotional practice written onto the rosary beads that are literally dependent on hanging from the crown of thorns. And you can see those words uh, in this, sorry, in this close-up um, PRNR for Paternoster, Ave, and Credo. Thinking across disciplinary boundaries thus helps us think across temporal boundaries, linking this image from the past and the to many foreign belief system that it represents with present forms of pedagogical innovation. But this image also speaks, I think, to current and future pedagogical challenges. Much has been written recently about the difficulties of teaching rigorous critical thinking in a world characterized by short-term, nonlinear, and abbreviated forms of expression. In versions of this argument, the nonlinear invitations of hyperlinks on web pages or the abbreviations encouraged by Twitter and internet vernacular are enemies of sustained analytic thought. This image shows, however, that comparably nonlinear forms of expression have been used in highly rigorous contexts. This page defies purely linear analysis. We may begin by reading the text in the upper left-hand corner, but our eyes are inevitably drawn to the images, to differences in color, both pictorial and textual. We are even forced to turn the manuscript around, since more detailed instructions for saying the rosary are written perpendicular to the main text as you can see in this close-up here, above and beneath the beads. In other words, the lateral thinking that this page encourages must have been intended to complement rather than compete with the critical thinking that this manuscript's theologically-minded producer clearly cared for, and that we as educators tend to value most highly. I think there's a lesson for all of us there, regardless of our field of study. More broadly, care for the future inspires our engagement with the past, as well as our current efforts to bring these different periods and our different disciplines into more fruitful conversation in MIT's undergraduate classrooms. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you all. We've been talking about students but we haven't heard from one, well, an ex-student. Um, with no further ado, we'd like to shift from now having introduced, I think, three really important perspectives on the education here. Um, some brief reflections from first Joel Yuen as one of uh, Bob's last year ops, and then from Bob Redwine as his dear colleague. Uh, so I want to thank the organizers and especially Professor Sylvia Sayer and Diana Henderson for giving me an opportunity to render tribute to my undergraduate research advisor, Bob Sylvie. So first let me say a couple of words of how I met Bob. So during my freshman year, I worked in two research groups in MIT terminology, the so-called Europe experiences, where I unfortunately did not fit very well. In the first lab devoted to organic synthesis, my task was to help a graduate student to mix some chemicals, but turns out that I was poorly skilled. I was very clumsy spilling solvents all over the bench <laughs> and wouldn't remember if I had poured a specific chemical in some mixture. 
So a mundane analogy is if you're baking a cake and you put twice the amount of sugar, but in chemistry, something more horrible than indigestion can happen. <laughs> so uh, a few months later, the professor calls me into his office and politically tells me, Joel, I think you should take 533 before you come back to this lab. Turns out that 533 was the last course of the undergraduate chemistry curriculum, so what he really meant was, Joel, never come back to my lab again. <laughs> so in the second lab, this time not organic synthesis, but inorganic synthesis, so I was stubborn. Uh, to my misfortune, I was assigned again to mix chemicals, and I, I soon foresaw the moment when I was, my boss was going to fire me, so I decided to have some what people call self-respect and voluntarily resigned. <laughs> so to be fair, I, uh, there was nothing wrong about these professors. It was, I was just a terrible experimentalist and just wasted the time of my advisors. For a while, I was quite disillusioned about chemistry, yet for two years at MIT, I had a really wonderful time focusing on humanities and mathematics courses. Actually, I think they were the highlight of my MIT experience, to be honest, the humanities courses, because people are very personable in, in, that, in those <laughs> subjects, as, as, well as, student, as well as student clubs, which I believe were the highlight of my MIT experience, um, the dorm and the clubs. It was a great time. Uh, when I arrived at my senior year, my academic advisor, Dan Nocera, convinced me that maybe I should try another type of chemistry which would not involve mixing chemicals, which was my nightmare. <laughs> so I asked the grad students around, and the suggestion was to contact Bob Silvey, who was famous for his thermodynamics courses, which unfortunately I didn't take, his PCHEM textbook, and also because of being a dean of science, but he was well known to be a nice guy and to train to be a very good advisor, uh, apparently everyone, all the grad students who worked for him would do very well. But also people warned me saying that Bob's research was what the people called hardcore stuff. So I looked up his papers online and I must confess that I didn't understand anything in them. Some of them contain equations that were just entire page, an entire page of equations. <laughs> so, um, Theoretical chemistry for all purposes is just physics and my physics background was not outstanding. Okay, so you might think what am I outstanding about? I am, but okay, I'll keep <laughs> talking about. So simply because I just hadn't taken many courses in my freshman requirements of physics, yet I wanted to try this out. So I asked Bob for a meeting and slowly after that I became a theoretical chemist. Working with Bob turned out to be a real pleasure, a great fit for my intellectual interests. This thing was very informal and relaxed. He pointed me to papers and textbooks to read and asked me to come out with some project I could reasonably finish. We decided I was going to work on something called the construction of effective Hamiltonians to explain absorption spectra of biological light harvesting system. Okay, that doesn't really matter for the, the story. <laughs> Even though he was really busy because he was the Dean of Science at that time, he encouraged me to meet with him every week for an hour or more to discuss my work. But what I want to emphasize was that Bob was actually not all business. To my surprise during our meetings, he would pull out a piece of paper and noticing my ignorance, my lack of knowledge, he would literally give me a private lecture on quantum mechanics instead of delving into the agenda of producing science right away. And I remember his handwriting being impeccable and the flow of his ideas very coherent in very simple terms without much jargon, just like the way knowledgeable people speak. He was a true theorist, a person who would be able to explain and make sense of things. I would ask him details of some theories and he would do derivations on the, sto on the spot in front of me without going through any notes. Once I felt really comfortable with the material, he would, uh, we would start talking about actual calculations for my project. Uh, being very honest, in retrospect, I don't think I accomplished much in my research during my Europe with Bob, but I certainly learned quite a lot about quantum mechanics and spectroscopy, which has proven to be extremely useful for my uh, graduate stu studies in theoretical chemistry. At some point, I remember telling Bob that how I had miserably failed as an experimentalist, to which he replied, that he was also a terrible experimentalist. He said that he quit experiments after breaking many Dewar containers in grad school in Chicago. 
then he smiled, and I remember this very vividly. He said, luckily, there is plenty of room for people like us. The only requirement you need to do to have to be a good theorist is to be a good student. And from your coursework, you already are. I really like the attitude of, uh, of Bob. He was always very friendly, smiley, and loved uh, telling stories. I could see that he really liked doing science, escaping once in a while from his bureaucratic duties as the dean of science. Ironically, even though Bob didn't pursue an experimental career, his theory remained always closely related to experiments. When Bob died, uh, many people who had met him at some point or another shared posts in Facebook. Uh, let me quote two people in particular. So one of them was, so I was the last Europe of Bob, but, but there was one before me, Shervin Fatehi, who I think he was a Europe in 2005 or something like that, now a postdoc at UPenn, also a theoretical chemist. He says, Bob sowed the seeds of my sometimes joyful, often frustrating, always stimulating engagement with theory. Uh, I can't thank him enough. Another comment by Alana Spurugusik, my boss at Harvard, who comments, Robert Silvey was a true scientific gentleman and one of my local scientific mentors. He will be missed. Now that I'm finishing my PhD, I can ascertain that Bob Silvey uh, was a true giant in the field of physical chemistry. And uh, his presence is still palpable up to these days when some of his seminal papers keep being cited. Actually, um, the current paper that I'm uh, writing, which is the one I'm going to use to finish my PhD, is based on a theory Bob developed in 1980s with Professor Harris in Berkeley. So a few days ago, just to conclude, I was having lunch with a friend, and I casually commented on how wonderful it must be a, to be a professor at one of these top universities, MIT or Harvard because you get the best students who already know everything and are ready to do research. <laughs> he disagreed with me. For him, an important part of the intellectual enterprise is to be able to teach those students who are not the best yet and help them grow to their full potential. And I reacted to this comment with shame, not having remembered that when I met Bob, I was certainly not the top physics student and needed a lot of refinement. And with his encyclopedic knowledge and impressive publication record, uh, Bob could have easily told me, well, I'm sorry, you're not qualified to, this, to do this work with me. Come back after you take five quantum mechanics courses. <laughs> I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm busy publishing my next paper. That's something that one could imagine very easily in these institutions, full of ego. But he did not. Instead, he assigned, assigned me readings, gave me homework, and met with me every week, just like a, t a real teacher. Uh, <laughs> Bob was an example that even in top research institutions such as MIT, one can also be a good teacher. Hence today, when we celebrate the McVicar Day, we also celebrate the memory of Bob Silvey, a great teacher who has inspired many of us in multiple dimensions as a scientist, as our intellectual role model, and as a human being. Thank you. Wow. I have to say, when I was asked by Diana uh, to give the closing remarks, uh, I was greatly honored. I am greatly honored. But I was also totally terrified because I knew I would be following a number of really smart, insightful, and of course, wonderful speakers. And as you can tell, my worst fears in this regard have been realized. <laughs> I do want to congratulate the new McVicker Fellows. Uh, it really is a wonderful honor for you and for us. Uh, when I was Dean for Undergraduate Education, uh, by far the most pleasant task I had was chairing the committee uh, that recommended to the Provost uh, the new McVicker Fellows every year. And um, as Dan has said, this is not an easy job. Uh, it's very hard to pick just a few. And what one learns is how many wonderful teachers there are around the Institute doing uh, very dedicated, innovative things. And that's always a, a very inspiring, um, though difficult, job uh, chairing that committee. I, I'm really quite conscious of the tradition and, and continuity and, 
that MIT has developed in undergraduate education. There actually have been only five deans for undergraduate education. As you know, Margaret McVicker was the first. Uh, she was followed by Art Smith, by Rosalind Williams, by me, and now by Dan Hastings. Um, and the fact that uh, this wonderful honor is named after her, after the first dean for undergraduate education, I think is very meaningful for a lot of us. I, I want to recognize one person who I see in the audience who I'm really glad is here, and that's John Deutsch. Uh, he's sitting over to the right. John, <laughs> John of course, is not only a, a longtime dear friend and colleague of Bob Silsby, but also he was provost. He was the provost who appointed um, Margaret McVicker as the first dean for undergraduate education. So he really has a special role in today's discussions. I also want to thank uh, Margaret's family. I don't think any are here today, but as many of you know, they have really kept close touch with the Institute and have played, in general, a very important role uh, in, in her memory and in keeping touch on occasions like today. Uh, so this year is, of course, a very special one uh, because we have lost Bob. And I really mean lost, because I, I feel it, as I know many of you do, uh, very personally. I think the word Diana used was, was raw. Um, it was interesting to me, two other speakers earlier have talked about Bob and neckties. Uh, I was also going to say something about that, so, <laughs> so I will. Um, Bob really was not fond of of neckties, in my experience. Uh, Bob Bergino, uh, who was Dean of Science when Bob uh, Silby was uh, head of the Department of Physics, used to tell the following story. Chemistry. I'm sorry, chemistry. <laughs> physics is taking a hard beating today, so I had to get it in. <laughs> chemistry. Thank you. So, Bergino apparently noticed that on those sort of ceremonial occasions when the uh, school, the department heads in the School of Science would get together that uh, everybody wore a tie except Bob Silby. <laughs> and uh, eventually he apparently commented to Bob that you know, it really would be nice if you wore a tie on these occasions. So the next occasion came around and Bob showed up in a full tuxedo. <laughs> And that was the last time Bergino asked him to wear a tie. <laughs> I hope you'll allow me to share a few more uh, memories. I, in preparing for this, I, I tried to remember the first time I met Bob. And frankly, I, I couldn't. Um, he certainly came to MIT before I did, uh, although I've been here a long time. Uh, but uh, he always just seemed to be a presence, uh, an important one uh, for many of us, and certainly not just those in the chemistry department. Uh, I do know that we got to know each other well in the 1990s uh, as members of Science Council. He was, of course, head of the Department of Chemistry. I was director of the Laboratory for Nuclear Science at that time. And he, he was obviously a, a voice of not just experience and wisdom, but also reason. Uh, as many of you know, he had an ability to make a point, an important point, usually, um, in a way that was respectful, uh, but, uh, but effective, and usually involved some humor. Uh, one of my favorite examples also involves Bergino, who was dean of science at that time. So uh, this was in the mid-90s, and Bergino had the idea that we should, the Science Council should go on an off-site retreat. Uh, I think this sort of thing is much more common now, but in those days it was not so common. So um, uh, planning went on for this, and I think the, the Science Council meeting, which was a couple of weeks before the retreat, there was a lot of discussion of, of various logistics about how the meeting would, would be done. And you, one could tell that uh, Bob Silby wasn't you know, totally convinced that this was a great use of time. But uh, yeah, anyway, he was listening. And finally, he, he interrupted and asked Bergino. He said, you know, concerning this retreat, uh, I can understand what and when and where and how, but I don't understand why. <laughs> And even Bergino had to laugh at that one. 
So he actually succeeded Bergino as Dean of Science early in 2000, and later that year, I was asked by Chuck Vest and Bob Brown to become, to succeed Rosalind Williams as Dean for Undergraduate Education. Um, it was a big change for me, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, but uh, I, I had certainly learned to appreciate Bob's judgment, and he was the Dean of Science, so I went to have a conversation with him to ask his advice on this. Um, it was probably the most serious conversation we ever had, uh, because he said to me, I think you probably should not do it. <laughs> and I, I have to say, I was very surprised uh, at that response, and I didn't understand it at first. Uh, eventually, I think I did come to understand it. So why did he say that? He was basically testing me to see how serious I was about this. I, I had spent the previous eight years directing the Laboratory for Nuclear Science, which at that time was the largest laboratory at MIT. Hadn't been doing much in terms of education or even thinking about education and classroom education. And I think he was not at all sure that uh, I was the right person. Uh, and uh, the last thing he wanted was someone who just had research credentials, who was interested in furthering his career, but maybe not so genuinely interested in, in undergraduate education. So we talked through that. Uh, and eventually, uh, not just one conversation, but eventually he, he came to understand that I really was serious about it. And when he was sure of that, of course, he embraced me fully as a partner uh, in education in many, many ways. We did work very closely together uh, over a number of years. Uh, certainly a, a lot of uh, what we worried about was the uh, the science part of the General Institute requirements. And he as Dean of Science and I as Dean for Undergraduate Education, of course, had a lot to, to uh, a lot of responsibilities in those areas. Um, again, we worked very closely on often complicated situations. Uh, for example, if there were a particularly delicate situation involving the chemistry department, he would ask me to deal with it. <laughs> and if there were a particularly complicated situation involving the physics department, I would ask him to deal with it. And so I think we actually complemented each other quite well. Um, a couple of years into my tenure as dean, and you've heard John describe uh, that at the end of the work of the task force on uh, student life and learning, there was the general feeling that the learning part was not finished. Um, and that that should be the job of a follow-up effort. I was certainly interested in getting that started. I, in talking to a number of people around the Institute, it was clear there was a, a lot of enthusiasm for doing that. Uh, I spent a lot of time talking with Chuck Vest about that because we really did want it to be uh, chartered by the president. Chuck was enthusiastic, and in all of our conversations in terms of who should lead this, I, I don't think we actually ever considered anybody except Bob. It was such the, so much the obvious choice uh, that uh, we asked him, and of course we were delighted uh, when he agreed to, to take on this additional task. And believe me, it was a lot of work over a significant period of time. Uh, the task force started in 2003, issued a report in 2006, uh, this was followed up by an, another group called the Implementation Subcommittee, which Bob also chaired, okay, which came up with specific uh, recommendations that Diana has alluded to. This work took uh, another year plus. So as, as many of you, of course, know, in the end, the package of recommendations, uh, and it was a package, it was presented as a package, was not agreed to uh, by the faculty. Um, and, of course, many of the recommendations, as you've also heard, have been implemented uh, uh, without doing it as a package. Uh, I'd like, in particular, to give a lot of credit to the School of Humanities, Arts, and Social Sciences, Deborah and her colleagues, and you've heard uh, directly some of the work that they've done on implementing the recommendations. Uh, but, of course, as Dan pointed out, others are being implemented as well outside the School of Humanities, Arts, and Social Sciences. After the faculty vote uh, that, uh, in fact, did not adopt the package, uh, Bob and I talked a lot about what had happened and why it had happened and what we might have done uh, better or in a different way to uh, make the case better. Uh, I, I have to say that um, you know, he was not a person who wanted to look back a lot and, and kvetch over things, and neither was I. 
so I think we decided to move forward and to try to help the Institute as much as we could to implement uh, the good things that we thought had come out from these discussions. Because actually the, the conversations among colleagues uh, in these meetings uh, and the many meetings uh, were just very important. And as you've heard, uh, a number of relationships were established in those discussions. A number of good ideas came out. Um, and uh, I'm very happy to say that the Institute and, and its faculty and students you know, have indeed continued to move forward to improve undergraduate education. And, and this really is, uh, to my mind, the, the, the rock base of MIT, the undergraduate aspect. It, a lot of times, I, I'm sure other faculty in the audience have the same experience. I get asked by colleagues, I said, you know, does MIT really feel like an undergraduate institution? Because you, you have more graduate students than you do undergraduates. I always answer that, I, I, th I think it very much feels like an undergraduate institution. And it is something that you know, we ask ourselves, certainly it was asked on academic council when I was there when the number of graduate students was increasing uh, significantly because we don't want to lose that. We want to uh, continue to feel like an, an undergraduate institution as well as being a great place to go to graduate school. And I think we do, uh, but that's certainly something we should continue to worry about. What more can I say about Bob? I, I'm sure you can tell how much I respected him and admired him and how much the loss is felt. Uh, he, in my experience, was the only senior administrator I've ever encountered, myself included, who, as far as I could tell, had no personal agenda whatsoever other than to do the right thing for MIT and the people at MIT. That is what he thought about. Uh, and that's what drove him. And it made him such a wonderful colleague in so many ways, and an effective colleague, I must say. So he left an amazingly positive uh, legacy. Uh, he was my colleague, and I'm proud to say he was also my friend. And I miss him more than I can easily express, and I'm sure that many people in the audience feel the same way. But it really is wonderful that we were able to honor him today, along with Margaret, uh, with all of these discussions and with so many of his friends, family, and colleagues here to participate. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Um, it's not a surprise that with these wonderful speakers, we have filled the time, and yet we have a few minutes. And I thought, rather than drag my colleagues up into the light, um, maybe we could hear if there are comments or questions from the audience or further th perspectives that anyone would want to share. We have a few minutes. So uh, the microphones are at either side. And I open the floor in case. And also, Brian is there with one. <laughs> there are, will be a microphone at either side in a second. Uh, if anyone would like to either address some of the educational issues, some of the progress issues, some of the change issues, or some of the personal reflections. Please, why don't you come down to the... Microphone, if you wouldn't mind. Thank you. I just stepped out of the plane um, and to, to get here. I'm, a, uh, I'm Hans von Himmerg from Utrecht University. I met Bob and Susan in uh, our local dining place for students and faculty alike at the time. And um, I was struck by uh, what was just said um, about Bob having no agenda at all and doing the best for uh, MIT. Um, I ended up my career almost uh, in undergraduate education and innovation of education, and I think I would never have uh, done that uh, or have the the vigor and the intensity of doing that without uh, the example that Bob had um, 
lived for me uh, in order to not just become a researcher, but uh, become someone who tries to do uh, the best thing for the students in all phases of their um, education. So I just wanted to say that. Thank you. Yeah. One of the goals today was for those who know Bob to have something that begins to be appropriate to acknowledge some of what he did. <laughs> and again, as I say, many things had to be left off that agenda and we were focusing primarily on undergraduate education because that is the focus of the McVicker Fellows. The other reason is to sort of, um, I think, pass the mantle um, to make this day important, I hope, for the new McVickers to feel like these, this is a very important community. Um, and it is not confined to the McVicker Fellows, but the McVicker Fellows played a le play a leadership role in making this visible to wider MIT. And I think sometimes we could do more. Sometimes we do all we can, and we're, we're all very busy people. <laughs> um, but I hope that one of the things we were aiming to do is to renew that sense of leadership and commitment and responsibility, hopefully without agendas, or at least with broad agendas, shared agendas, collaborative agendas as we move forward. So with that, let me um, mention that there is, uh, some of you know, there is a, a, a symposium ending at this point, but there is also um, a McVicker picture. All you McVickers out there, we'd like to get you Embodying community for the record at 515 at the president's house, um, followed by a reception, which I don't know if I was supposed to mention or not, but I think anyone <laughs> who is here at this moment, having uh, benefited and valued what we've talked about today, I hope you will join us at Gray House at 530, should you choose to raise a glass and to praise our new McVickers again. Thank you all.